Jenna, thank you so much for that beautiful music. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Welcome, everyone. We're so glad you're here with us in the sacred circle. And it's day three of our seven days of rest. It's our topic for Jenna today, which is so beautiful, thank you, Jenna, is radiance, expression, and expansion of the heart. So welcome. We're so glad that each and every one of you are here. I'm Tezekiah Gabriel from Pathways to Peace. I'm the executive director. And um, Pathways to Peace is just so honored and so delighted to be supporting and promoting Jenna's work, Dr. Jenna Darko. And so because Jenna has so much wisdom for us to share, we're going to move along fairly quickly this morning. And what I know is 
thank you for those of you who have joined us again. <laughs> you know, as I look at the names and when we're lucky, your faces. Oh my goodness, it's so wonderful to have you back with us. And for those of you who are new, I think what you'll find is that if you can open your heart and your mind to hear that an activation will occur and our lives are forever changed, right? And so before we move into the expression and expansion of the heart that Jen is going to bring around radiance, let's just rest a little and open up our hearts to the expression of our own heart and allow that truth within us to unfold. So I invite you to just settle into your chair or if you're standing to settle into the floor, imagine that we're resting in the womb of this beautiful mother earth. And we slow our breath and we deepen our breath. And if it helps to count, we can count five counts on the inhale and five counts on the exhale. As we just rest in that divine, sacred, safe, beautiful, loving womb. And if your mind strays, that's okay. Bring it back to your breath as we breathe together. The one breath. And as we establish a comfortable pace with our breathing, let's focus our attention on the center of the chest, the seat of the heart, and imagine our beautiful breath going in and out through that beautiful heart space. You can't do it wrong, so just relax into it. As we breathe together, the one heart, the one heart of the universe, the one heart of being one with all that is the one heart right here connected in this sacred circle. And with every breath, let us feel the opening and expansion of the heart. See the color of your heart. Feel that love and that nurturance, that compassion, that kindness, that peace. As you expand all of that beautiful energy into every cell of your body, really embracing your own divinity and knowing that in your heart. And as we feel that beautiful loving energy flowing through us, we can ask the question, What does my heart wish to express? 
what would my heart have me know about this point in time? And allow the heart's expression to come forward and to be known. And with that knowledge of that gift, and with that open heart, and the knowing of our divine selves, we bring that love into this sacred circle, that knowledge that we are all one, that gift that we've been given to bring all of that into this physical space, into this physical circle. And you can take deep cleansing breaths if that helps to return. Wiggles your fingers and toes if that helps to return into these beautiful physical bodies in this space and time. And without any further ado, it is my absolute pleasure and honor and delight to bring forward my beloved colleague, Dr. Jenna Darka. Jenna. Thank you, Tezakaya. Thank you everyone for being here. It's beautiful to see some of you, see some of you again, to see some of you for the first time and to see some of the same names coming, coming through. It's feeling like we've got some soul friendship weaving here that is really dear. Which is why each of us, I think, shows up for these kinds of things. It's this way of connecting, being in a space where we feel ourselves and we feel a sense of being in this together like a herd of horses that togetherness that sense of being in connection is vital it is survival The horses remember that very deeply. And some can survive in ways where they're contracted into some individuality. Um, you know, some horses might be alone or have a friend. Oftentimes people, if they have a lone horse, will have a goat or other smaller companion. But by and large, the horses thrive and are posed in community wild horses in family groups. Some of those family groups have continuous membership for millions of years and they are still on the planet now. I think as humans, sometimes we forget that. <laughs> We're so uh, mobile now and can migrate and cross-pollinate on the planet we might forget that much of the animal kingdom has stayed in family groups for millions of years as they have evolved. Domesticated horses, we tend to put in groups where some have some family lineages. Mine are full brother and sister who are with me now. 
They had a lot of their full and half brother and sisters around them for much of their lives. And there is a kinship connection I see in them that runs very deep. Many horses have friends who become their family. I think we relate to that as humans. The importance of being together. I have a friend who calls it being heard, which I love that play on words. So in English, heard, H-E-R-D is a group of horses. And to be heard, to be listened to is H-E-A-R-D, but they sound the same. And to be heard in this way of being truly felt, being known. For our essence, for who are you? Horses recognize each other. We recognize each other. We've seen each other. We hold one another in memory and we can think of someone and we feel of their essence. And we have this knowing of one another in the moment, feeling of one another in the moment that comes through the particular resonance of whatever is being felt and, and sent out um, from our nervous system, from our heart, from our mind, which is all one, our vehicle. And so here we are together. As... Hezekiah was speaking of our oneness and said the word universe. And of course, universe was a theme in the song that we played. So for those who uh, don't see the chat, but are watching this later, that was Heart of the Universe by Sanatam Kar and Peter Cater. So that prefix, uni, U-N-I, right? You and I, <laughs> uni, one, unified, unity. Also is the same prefix for unique. So we are all one unified body of humanity, of planetary life, of cosmic life, of existence in this universe. And we are each one expression of that in this in the absolute sense we are all one unified body in the limited sense of taking an incarnation as a specific being with a specific design with a specific purpose with a specific soul song a specific history her story thread in the tapestry of our story we are one a specific one, a unique one, an intentional one, a consciously created one. And I love that when we uh, can play with those things, I have a mind that likes to play with words and, and feel into these facets of creation like this. I love that it, the same root word, uni, is universal and unique. Because that's really the way that we dance. It's two sides of the same coin. That's inseparable. It's the way that we dance in this life. And if we can touch on both. Oh, I have this unique expression. There's something that radiates from me of this light that I am. That is unique. And I do this in this universal way of being in the web of life with everyone else in their unique expression so that together we are all. And if we get into the esoteric understanding, the quantum science understanding of the nature of the universe, we, any one of us, any individuated particle of this mass of humanity, mass of earth life being, All is contained within any one part because we are what we call holographic. So if you have not yet explored that kind of a concept, it is amazing. So basically, if you Google 
hologram, holographic, a holographic universe. You'll, you'll find brilliant tutorials. Things are just so available now to, t to teach us science and uh, conceptual things. Basically, a holographic image is something that has a nature that if you divide it in half, both of those halves have the whole thing. So many of us have seen these kinds of things, even in like uh, gift shops, where there will be a, a plastic object. Usually it's something that's in a cube or um, maybe another kind of shape, but usually in a, in a maybe clear cube. And there will be a little image in there. And no matter what angle you look at it, you're not only looking at part of the angle of the thing, you're looking at it in 3D. You can see as you rotate it that the whole thing continues to be whole no matter what little slice of perspective you take. And so that is part of the nature of us. Everything in this universe is contained within each and every one of us. All is contained within us as one whole. And so for me, this is part of when we go back to day one, it's the miracle of being together through this presence. The presence is unified. And through this miraculous way of life being created, that presence infuses and experiences itself through each of us in a unique way. And in some traditions, it's, it's said so that love can see itself face to face. There's one quote that I love that says, basically, creator has said, I divided myself from myself so that I could love myself more. And what a task that can be for us as a humanity to learn to love myself more, to love myself and one another more. And it's, I believe the reason that we exist is to be able to step into that love, step into that knowing fully and completely aligning ourselves with that presence that is the love of all. And this radiance theme brings me to that grateful heart of having had enough of that knowing enough moments where that knowing felt so complete that even in a moment where that knowing might be shaded or forgotten or colored by a complexity or challenge it's still impossible to not know it <laughs> and That is part of the purpose of being here with each of you today to bring forward is that sense that that is constantly radiating through the universe, through all life. And that we can know ourselves and one another is an expression of that in this beautiful diversity of multiplicity that has one golden thread running through all of it. When we let our heart expand into that knowing, it can be, I see, you know, just the, the feeling of this being felt even on screen, which is so purely beauty. It can overwhelm our little sense of being a separate self, which is great <laughs> because that's the entire point. Let it be overwhelmed. <laughs> it can simultaneously help us to feel so vast and so small. And again, that's the entire point. And so to hold all of that can be a real paradox. One that I invite us to carry forward through everything else that we, that we talk about. So we are all one. We are holy one. We are each one unique expression. And by coming together and learning of one another, and sometimes having this rub of friction of even conflict, con meaning with, flicked or flicra is to strike together, through to strike. So con with, flicra, strike, to strike together. 
conflict. So if we strike those places within us that have some resonance or disresonance of pain, separation, and anguish, it refines out anything that is this dust and uh, static in, in our fields so that that light, that radiance can more and more and more shine through our lives. That we can see that more clearly in the eyes of another. We are each an expression of this heart of the universe. The universe expresses itself through us, thereby expands itself and evolves. Always moving, always changing. And paradoxically, always the same, always eternally complete. And when we remember, there can be dissolving the forgetfulness, coming into remembrance, coming back to knowing. And when we remember, we re-include all of the members of ourselves, all of the parts that are the histories, the child parts, the protective parts, the defensive parts, the dreaming parts of ourselves. And remember our own humanity is one reclaim our membership together in this family on earth. The universe becomes more aware of itself through us. And so my feeling very strongly over these years is that the horses are helping us to remember Remember being felt and heard as one. As one marvelous stream of ongoing life over generations and generations and generations. And to them, with their ancestral root race being 50 million years old, we are their young sibling And that's just a part of our identity here on this planet. We also are co-creators of this life. That some of us may even have either deep within a subtle percolating sense of something or very forefront awareness of having been part of that radiant light weaving this mother earth, seeding her with various expressions of mineral forms, plant forms, of animal life, and putting as a capstone our own human expression for our path. And we must remember that our human capstone for our path does not supersede a capstone path of any other species, any other cosmic soul seed that may have arrived here if we can go that expansive and I do <laughs> so you know we are all star beings we are born of stardust science is even even the most mundane scientific um I will say out of uh, some of my family ancestors curmudgeonly doubting ah the spirit stuff is crazy, you know, hear, hear the words of my step-grandfather, who is a uh, astrophysicist and aeronautical engineer, who upon his deathbed saw the light that my aunt had been talking about as an energy healer for their whole relationship and said, there really is a light. And she told him, yeah, this is how you can go to it in his final moments. Even he this was decades ago, the science was becoming very clear that the atoms in our body were formed in the crucible of the stars. The same helium, the same hydrogen, the same what became oxygen, carbon, where we are of that same stardust. There's these great mysteries that are held in ancient schools that hold awareness of where some of those stars are 
and how they resonate in our body. So the atoms in your foot may come from a different star system than the atoms in your heart. Anybody want to guess where the atoms in the heart are held in ancient wisdom traditions of astrology to have uh, what constellation holds some of that stardust that's uh, been in the line of uh, these solar suns that are the life force of planetary systems. Anybody want to guess on the Zodiac? You put it into the chat or you want to raise your hand. Um, anybody want to guess where the, the heart, you may know if you, if you have this as an intellectual background um, of study um, or an intuitive knowing, where of the constellations does that heart sit in our 12 Zodiac themes? Leo, Leo governs our hearts, the lion beings. What about the horses? Where do they fall in our astrology? Where can we see them on our zodiac? Anybody want to throw that in, make this interactive today, or you can just think it and play with me. So there's one constellation that is a centaur being, half human, half horse. In many uh, cultural traditions, it's a man body, or upper body, and a horse lower body. And this is an archer holding a bow and arrow. A wise sage being holding divine wisdom, Sagittarius. So we just came out of Sagittarius into Capricorn. It took me many years to, I studied some astrology and I had more of the Western uh, view, viewpoint. And so I knew that opposite Sagittarius centaur being was the Gemini twins, but I had always just heard of them as twins. Um, like in Greek uh, astrology, they would be twin humans, very, very clearly represented. Well, then I started studying with a yogi, um, the Vedic sciences. And I learned that the Gemini twins in that cultural lens, as well as some others along the planet, they are often represented as twin horsemen or twins with horse heads or twin horse medicine men or twin doctors who each have a companion that is a horse. I was like, wow, this is so cool and makes so much sense. And now I feel at home. Um, I'm born under the sun sign of Gemini. And that means that the opposite sign is Sagittarius. So if you stand in the center of that, so if you ever have the chance to do this, it's fun if you haven't already. Um, find a good clear night. Go out under the stars. Find a constellation that is easy and clear to see. And if you can, usually you can, usually you can, because the sky, at least about half of it is above the horizon um, at, at, at night, maybe not quite, but you know, it's uh, depending on where we are on the planet, but we can see a lot. If you have a good clear night and there's different um, star chart apps where you can see the uh, stars. If you have a nice app on your phone um, where you can hold your phone up and it will show you where is Leo where's Virgo? And, and you can like scan the horizon and you'll see it's this ecliptic. It's a circle around us where these main uh, zodiac constellations uh, are. Find one that is prominent for you. So most of us know our star sign as what our zodiac sign is. Um, so if you know what that is, that's an awesome one to, to find. Um, another great sign is to look up your moon sign and find what is your moon sign. Usually that has some strong resonance if you're attuned in, in any ways to these things. Or your ascendant, which is um, not always found on a, a natal chart if you plug it in, but if you Google natal chart ascendant, you can calculate that. And for many people, that's a really powerful one because part of it is what are we here to ascend into being in this lifetime? What is our journey upward and onward as we carry through our years and, and have that becoming become a very rich part of 
our soul's um, expression. Whereas our sun sign is kind of naturally like you're born to express this. The moon sign is that more inner emotional part of us. So those tend to be some signs that we might have resonance with. And if we feel into that constellation, we might just feel a sense of beauty, a sense of oh, there's something expanding in my heart as I connect to these stars. So one of the things I love to do is um, it's not always possible. But sometimes at a certain time of day, um, summertime, where we have, um, no, sorry, um, equinox times tend to be the easiest for this to become possible. Um, well, it varies. I'm now I'm getting a little too complicated. I'll just simplify this. Stand somewhere with your heart, your face towards a constellation and look at it. One that is radiant within you. And then feel a sense of what's exactly behind you. What's got your back. And you'll feel this polarity sometimes of being held. So I have just delighted in this. Um, maybe some of you are also either Gemini or Sagittarius and here um, with the horses. And so it might speak to you. I have just delighted in knowing that as a being born in Gemini, there are these equine facets of these star knowings held anciently within cultures who have kept that wisdom that I can look to and go, I, I know you. You look and feel like me, a reflection of directness. And I can sense that this is an energy that's got my back. If you are in Leo, Aquarius is opposite. So bringing in the lions and the horses. <laughs> Aquarius really is about stepping into our love of humanity. And the lion holds the heart. So what a beautiful holding. Often with the equine kingdom, I bring in also the bovine kingdom. They are kin, the hooved ones who walk our planet. And I, I sense, and our, our goat friends too, actually per capita, there are more goats that interface with human life, mostly actually in the form of being eaten, consumed. Goat meat is the most uh, common meat eaten on the planet. So those are so much kin in upholding the human experience in terms of what we consume, in terms of how the earth is fertilized and cultivated, in terms of, in the case of domestic horses, how we live with them, how we experience day to day, how we relate with them. In the star charts, the star that really exist in the world. So not just the charts that we can see, you know, on paper to represent them, but in the, in the star, in the constellations, I've grown to love knowing that the horses are infused into Gemini, that they sit right next to the bull of Taurus. The bull being the masculine, the cow being the feminine of that energy. The milk giver. The one who says, I will nourish you and nourish you and nourish you and has extended that to humankind. The bull. Holding the bull's eye, the center of things, inviting us in to see the center of everything through the reflection of that bull's eye, the eye of the bull. Do we see that in one another? Can we remember to find that radiant light expressed in each other? Can we feel of how that expands us? Because whenever we are with one another, some unique resonance from that being resonates with something within us. I didn't talk about this yesterday, but this is a theme that I meant to with the resonance. There's just so little time, <laughs> but um, especially with our musician friend, uh, Alicia being on, 
one of the fun facts of uh, physical science about resonance and music is that many of you might know this. If you pluck uh, or sound a string on a string instrument at one frequency, one note, one tone, one sound, and that sound rings out through the environment, a string instrument that is just still not being played, as long as the sound is loud enough and the resonance can travel, that string will vibrate on the still instrument to the same tone, the same note, the same frequency. And so it is with us. So it is with our hearts. So it is with who we are. So it is with what we feel in a moment. If we have a note played within us, and maybe it's just our soul signature. It's this note, that song, this tune that we are singing all the time is how we are composed. Or maybe it's a feeling, a thought, an intention, a dream, a question, a yearning that we're sending in, in a moment. That resonates throughout all. And this grand design of this universe conspires to bring us something that is co-resonant. We can have a shared experience. So we might be in a field together and see a horse run. And we might look at each other. And we might have experienced that same beauty and go, yeah, that. <laughs> we might be in conversation and all of a sudden a certain word, a certain topic gets highlight and we are like excited and we can resonate and we can know we're speaking the same language. We've got the same interests. There's this co-resonance, this co-vibration, the same song being played within us. So these hoofed ones bring us into opportunity to understand that to be heard, to be seen, to be felt in community and connection, it's important for us to clearly radiate. So we'll also get into this when we get into the clarity day, to clear, clearly radiate our heart. So as we were sitting in this beautiful meditation that Tezakaya brought us into, she asked this wonderful question, what does my heart wish to express? What does my heart wish to express? What does my heart have me know about this point in time? So we're here together, let's open and connect in this way. Let your light shine, let us know and see who you are if you would like to. This radiance is very, very key to each of us being able to know our purpose for this lifetime. our unique purpose. What are we each here to contribute? Horses in any social structure will show their uniqueness. They will show their roles. They will show their tendencies and how they interact with one another. And horses in the wild have extremely sophisticated social structures and roles. I know glimpses of that, but I'm not um, an expert and others are. <laughs> so if this is something that you seek to learn about, I encourage you to explore that. And I just trust that you will find resonance with whomever speaks to you as you search that out. Um, finding a sense of how do they have specialties how do they go in and out of different roles based on the needs of the overall group, based on the conditions of the environment at the time is exquisite. And I believe it can help point us to understanding how we can understand ourselves as a humanity to orchestrate ourselves in more resonance, in more coherent ways, so that we can bring forward our individual lights in collection with the whole light that is trying so valiantly to uplift us into more peace and harmony. 
And so I think that the horses have some keys to help us understand their social structure so that we can see how they have survived on this planet for millions of years to help us recalibrate ourselves. So we don't become the ruin of our species by destroying life on the planet, um, which is a possibility if we go astray. It's also a very possibility. And I believe we have developed such resonance, such coherence that we are putting ourselves on track actually to have the best of the possible futures ahead. So I hold that bright hope and also acknowledge that this is choice and, and we must choose um, to align ourselves with this radiant light-based knowing in order to rally our resources for the good of all. So the, the equine kingdom has ways that we can understand for doing that. And each of us has within ourselves a knowing. Each of us has within ourselves longing or questions or senses of where something is hitting a barrier that means that we can turn in a new direction. So what might that be here? That unique purpose is nested within the universal purpose. And the universal purpose is to know ourselves as love or any number of other ways we can say it, but it's something that has to be felt and known from the inside out. So bookmarking that is an invitation to just find ways to touch the heart and draw us into that remembering. So I'll leave time now if anybody wants to come forward with any kind of questions or sharings or just saying who you are, what brings you here, what makes your heart sing. We would love you, if you can, to turn on your video. Thank you to those who, who already have, and we honor if you can't, but we love seeing your beautiful faces. And Jenna, just thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, such wisdom. Thank you. And so Jenna has opened up to your questions, your thoughts, your comments, um, anything that you'd like to share. And all are welcome. You can unmute yourself and ask, or you can put it in the chat, whatever works. And we can just be here together too in silence. If that is what emerges, that's also perfect. Yes. Emily, I, I'm feeling you. Do you have anything you'd like to say. Thank you. I, this, this was so beautiful, Jenna and Desikaya, thank you. And I'm, I was sorry to miss the first two days uh, unavailable scheduling wise. I deeply appreciate this space right now as I'm in a, a very painful place personally, place in process. And as we were beginning, and even as the music was playing, um, one of the ways the pain was manifesting right now was anxiety. And I was feeling my heart. It felt like a balloon that was getting blown up and could explode. And it was in this space, and especially Tessica, as, as you offered your opening meditation, and then as I was listening to Jenna speak, I just, I was being with it, and I wasn't labeling it, or, or not, I did label it anxiety, but if I go into what the story is around the anxiety, that feels almost intolerable. And so I just stayed with that sensation. What is that sensation? And then as I was listening, it was just, so beautiful to be in this space it's very raw this uh pain in me and to be with other people and in a space is very new to me when i'm feeling that way and it's just there's just a lot of beauty in it and i really appreciate it thank you mm -hmm. and and i also will say that i well no i think i've, I've said enough for now thank you Thank you for sharing that and so grateful that you are able to 
not only share, but accept and allow that um, it's so important and so vital and so beautiful without judging it, just to accept and allow. So thank you so much. Yes. Makes me um, feel, Emily, hearing you say about being with that raw pain and knowing that vulnerability of the rawness of pain, sometimes the excruciating way that that is of how it can feel to be held in circle in a, in a, in a, in an embrace. And maybe that's part of why, what came through today, this, I, I had some ideas percolating earlier that probably coming from the fields that we were all establishing as we had intention to be here, it had some to do with a Zodiac ecliptic but there was something that just was like, that's going to be where this is honing in. And so I just want to amplify that in sharing now that this, the whole star system surrounds you in 360 degrees and knows every atom twinkling in your body now and always. And I just want to witness that you are held in that love at the center of it. It completely surrounds you and you can be in the center of it all. You can't not be in the center of it all. <laughs> it's how creation works. We're here. You are in the center of it, held by all of that empowerment, all of that spaciousness, the vastness the darkness and the light of it, the twinkling. You know, just being aware that whether it is nighttime and you can see the stars, but then it's dark and so we get really still and quiet. They're there. And as the daylight starts to break, over the horizon and the sky becomes blue and the stars fade and we might forget that they're all there as we go about the busyness of the daytime activities. They're there constantly surrounding us, holding us, seeing us, knowing us, being us, being within us, being between us. But that is always powerfully true and present and upholding the fabric of our lives. Thank you. And this, this beautiful universe, that cosmos that Jenna laid out, holding you, supporting you, this sacred circle right here in that holographic way yeah. holds all of that yeah. for you. All of it in our love for you in this moment, in this point in time. So just know that, feel that. And Emily, by you being willing to let your life and light be a focal point of this now, being in pain and being together, receiving space for this connection, you're an entry point for all of us to feel that love at the center of things. And I thank you for that. And have two been at the center of things, being a focal point when in pain and have remembrance now in me of those who have held that space so that the rawness of my tears could come forward. And I'm so grateful for everyone here just holding this kindness, knowing that the world aches for this kind of kindness when we're in pain. And if we can do it here and now, 
It's medicine that radiates, expresses itself, expands everywhere. So may we extend this moment of loving kindness to all who are feeling pain. May we take in the loving kindness as a balm for all of the ways that we feel pain. May we unite our hearts together as a herd, as a family, to give forward the sense of being heard one with another, hearing the aches of this world and responding by listening, touching upon the pain together, being with one another in this private quiet moment that is completely connected to every pain that also, just as love radiates, the pain radiates. That way love can meet the pain And there is a dynamic where just like a shadow cannot suppress light, pain cannot suppress love. Light illuminates the shadows and light helps to dissolve the pain. And we don't forever stay in the light. It would scorch us. So we come back and forth. And the darkness the shadows, uh, the things that arise that stand out as needing attention are vital, are part of the perfection. And sometimes in the moments, totally excruciating. And so the tenderness of kindness is absolutely essential and it comes from the essence that we are. Bringing this back to horses, another way to visualize and feel into this kind of way of circling and care. If you have a herd of horses, they are all scanning for safety. They are all scanning for change, for threat, for what do we need to know about and how might we have to move together to stay safe and protected and the horses that are on the outskirts are always scanning. So the eastmost horse is picking up on that eastern portion of the field and then sending information through all of the herd and the westmost horse is doing the same. So they have a 360 degree awareness together. So having more horses is more helpful because there can be more scanning. And it can then help relax the others who maybe then don't have to be on this like full-time job. So I bring my horses, there's, there's two of them inside at night now because there's only two of them. So if one is resting, another one has to be managing the 360 full-time gig of scanning. That's tiresome. Herds of more horses spread it out. They take turns being really alert, really aware and at rest. And then they rotate based on how anyone's feeling, if they, if they have the luxury to do so, where they can put the ones who need rest in the center. They'll put vulnerable ones who've been hurt or injured or who are older, um, if, they, if they, their energy is slowing down in various moments, or sometimes it's like, hey, now this is your role. This is where you reside in our herd structure, is in the center where they can just rest more. So for each of us who needs that knowing, take that image with us and remember to feel into that. And if we have community that can provide that, beautiful. We need one another to do that. If that resource is not available, we can draw on the herds that exist throughout the world, knowing that they are doing it that way. And we can sit privately just soaking that in. And I will tell you, sometimes that is just the dose of medicine that we need. And we can remember the stars are doing it always too.
for us as us. So Thank you, Jenna. Run us over time. <laughs> yes, and I do want to honor Alexandra's question, and perhaps we take it, we close, and then pick it up afterwards. Um, yeah. But she is um, asking for some wisdom around um, a young man or a boy that's participating in university classes with her who is a Leo and is bringing a lot of anger into ah. those classes. And she is wondering how to uh, work with that, that energy. And so I know some of you might need to leave and go to other events. So um, we'll try to make our closing really brief. And if you'd like to stay on, we are willing to be, uh, have the room open and stay on with you, Alexandra, to answer. And I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name, um, but to stay on and at least address that question. But if there are other words or other questions that are on your heart, we're, we're here and we'll be open for a while. So um, in closing, Jenna, thank you, thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, you're, it's just such an honor. I, I keep saying the same words and the words aren't adequate to really express the deep, deep gratitude and how much I honor um, the, your ability to bring through that wisdom, to articulate it so clearly and beautifully as a way to support each of our evolution and the evolution of our planet and our universe. And so I'm just in deep love and gratitude for you. Mm -hmm. So thank you. And uh, Pathways to Peace, we always say everyone is a pathway to peace, regardless of where you've been, who you are, what you've done, you are a pathway to peace. And we're so honored to join you as you bring that peace from your heart into our, our universe. So thank you, thank you, thank you for bringing your presence in here into this sacred space and helping us hold that sacred space of love for everyone here and beyond. And so thank you. And for those of you who feel you would, you need to leave, this is an opportunity for you to do that. And otherwise we'll take a deep breath after this for anyone who still would like to remain. So thank you. Thank you, Tazakaya. And peace prevails on earth. It is so. I love anger. That used to be really hard for me to say, really hard for me to even conceive of as possible. But as I have had opportunity to feel anger within my body mind, I have grown appreciation for its wisdom. As I've watched anger in others in so many forms, it can be so difficult to stay present with, and yet I have grown to have so much appreciation for that anger that others express. In my background, the topic that I have my PhD in is psychology. And so I spent a decade at the university and a decade in practice and immersing in that aspect of the human experience. And I had this wonderful mentor, many who would say the same thing, but one in particular always stands out to me. She was one of the most gentle, 
refined beings in her personality and in her appearance. And she was a woman with an increasing uh, vision impairment. And so with that loss of vision, as, as that progressed, she also would talk about how much more vulnerable she felt in the world because she could not see if something was going to be out of harm. However, she had lived in such a peaceful, refined, kind way that of course she was very surrounded at home and at work. And when she would go out and about with people who loved her and would take very, very good care of her. One of her subspecialties was doing the anger management programs with veterans. And sometimes at first these very, I mean, anger management groups with veterans, like you, you bring however many, maybe it was 20 angry. And some of these groups were specifically divided by men and women. Some of them were just open, but sometimes we would have these all male groups. So we'd have maybe 20 angry men in a room. And sometimes, you know, if I was there, um, co co facilitating, obviously I am in a female body and, um, have a lot of feminine expressions that sometimes the men would look at and go, Oh, and sometimes they would size me up and wonder, you know, are you going to be weak? You know, are you going to cry? How's this going to be? And I would watch them observe her. And they would sometimes notice she was very delicate in her appearance and they would kind of watch that. And then over time, we'd start to speak and you would see that this one was fierce and fearless in the face of anger. She had cultivated so much love, including allowance for anger to really be real and raw, that it it didn't frighten her one bit. And sometimes I would test that and get kind of ragey. And she would hold so beautifully this boundary of, I hear you, I'm with you. And so now she'd be more firm, you know, but like, I hear you, I'm with you. And in order for me to really be with you with this anger, I'm going to need you to step back a little bit. And maybe if you would be willing, sit down, you know, in other words, like take your angry, raging male body who could harm me and back up a bit, rein yourself in, sir. You know, but sometimes she would say it very fiercely. Sometimes she would say it so kindly. Anyway, I I learned so much about anger watching her, who was a woman who seemed to not really get angry (laughs) um, in ways that we might identify as typical. However, she knew anger well. And one of the things that she would always say is that underneath anger is always some degree of some combination of fear, hurt, helplessness, and powerlessness. So those are like the ingredients behind anger. And anger might bluff us into thinking it's something else because sometimes it's very aggressive. Um, But tuning in to that more tender, and powerless element of anger, I learned over time could show me so much more about what is the anger about? And then how can you do a turn from it into something more healing? Or um, anger tends to fragment. Anger pushes away or grabs on to power pushes something away. You're not welcome here because I'm angry at you or grabs on. I'm taking control with this anger. And so seeing anger through this lens that she taught was really powerful. What is the more tender thing that can turn us towards healing? And finding the root of that in some form of fear, really all of that helplessness, hurt, powerlessness, that's all a form of fear. When we see somebody acting out in anger, often we feel afraid because they might be exhibiting behaviors that are out of control and could generate harm. And so then to feel fear is natural alarm bell ringing in us to help us stay safe. And so we can thank that and then look and go, is this safe? And if it is safe to be present and explore it, 
And that might be physically safe and it might be emotionally safe. Do we have capacity to be with the other person's anger in that moment? If we can be with it and we can look at that root of fear and having those index terms of hurt as a particular kind of fear or pain was really helpful because then we can see where is this wound? What hurts behind this anger? And it can turn us towards a lot of compassion. And sometimes that can help dissolve whatever that anger is about, or we might find wisdom and we might be able to do something. And that might be the remedy for the powerlessness or the helplessness that the person is experiencing. We may be able to do something in advocacy, or we may be able to help them do something in empowerment. So what is the hurt, fear, helplessness, powerlessness underlying that anger? Um, are kind of those questions to explore. So that's kind of just on the topic of anger. I wanted to put that out there for whatever it's worth. I'm going to, um, Alexander, read your question because there might also be more specifics in it. Um, so I'll get my bearings and then feel free to, um, you know, unmute and, and talk back and forth. And we can kind of play with this as a, an example of, of anger and how it appears in our world. So I'm just reading here. Um, hmm. I love talking with them about unique universality as we are one. That's beautiful. So there's, I'll read this um, for people to be able to know uh, what we're looking into here to explore. So there's also one boy, so conscious and smart, but shy, Aquarius. Yeah, and great that, that you have some knowledge about, about his composition. You know, so Aquarians often feel different. Aquarius is uh, ruled by the planet Uranus, which is about uniqueness. <laughs> And it's about sometimes being, uh, bringing surprise, bringing kind of shock and, and differentness um, in a way that can um, cause the mind to be like, oh, what's that? And so if he's holding that resonance, people might be reacting to him in that way because it's stirring it in them. Um, so just a possible thought. Uh, my sister is Aquarius being. So I have great love for Aquarius and also know what it's like in my own way to experience um, sometimes that challenge that comes with sibling experiences. And I think classrooms um, have so many dynamics happening with the social structure of the children that that can be like sibling relationships because they're all also about the same age. And so they're going to hold certain constellations um, the same uh, because you get a classroom of people together who are in similar age. So that's sometimes an overlooked dynamic in school systems that is of uh, cosmic importance um, and have a question about what to do with another Leo boy who is destroying classes in such anger and communication and always wanting attention. So I love this. Um, so you've got the Aquarian and Leo uh, polarity where that's opposite on the uh, star energies. Um, as they sit opposite on the, the Zodiac. So, so cool, you know, and how interesting that these, these boys are bringing up the anger in different ways and kind of uh, archetypically according to the, to the Zodiac signs. So it's going to be much more natural for an Aquarius being to have that uh, intellect. It's an air sign. So it's the mind having that smartness, you know, that you see in him. And maybe that shyness is a part of being um, unique and, and maybe being feeling himself as different than others. It tends to be a characteristic um, of Aquarius. So retracting into some shyness and he's probably doing a lot of ob observing. So the planet Uranus travels a wide, long orbit around us, distant from us. So it can step back and watch. <laughs> So that may be kind of part of what is, is going on there. Um, that observation, watching that social planet, you know, knowing like, oh, this is what the people are about. This is what's going on here. Uh, it's an Aquarian trait. And then the Leo boy um, acting in this direct way of anger, expressing the fire of anger as, you know, fire is, uh, Leo is a fire sign. So one thing I would just say is if, as I'm listening to these boys um, through your words and feeling this, um, feeling into my roles, just one who's now witnessing. And if I were there in the classroom, I would wanna just first be like, I see this. These are dynamics that make sense. You know, like, yeah, the fire is here, fire of anger. 
But what is turning that from a radiant warmth of saying, hey, this is an important thing. Let's attend to this, you know, that anger can can do. Anger will will bring awareness. It will surface something, maybe something that's being overlooked. And so it has that power that is really rich and can be very, very constructive. But then something is getting distorted. If, if there's a vibe to it that is ang- angry in a way that can be off-putting or destructive. Um, the always wanting attention, you know, Leo is governed by that sun that is soul essence. And so that can be very much a part of the Leo structure of personality that comes forward. So maybe looking at where is there a really wholesome need of that attention and how can that be provided? Um, that might quell that need of that being who's honoring the soul saying, I am here to radiate meanness, me-ness, the, the, the essence of myself. I'm here to radiate who I am. Uh, maybe that's being missed at home or in other relationships or in other aspects of the school that maybe could be met in a constructive way. So sometimes giving a child such as that a speaking platform um, that's structured in a way that's constructive can sometimes then lessen the the anger coming out in communication that distracts the classroom or giving them a speaking platform or a leadership platform uh, may be a possibility. This is just going kind of based on that Leo position. Um, so that those are some thoughts, but if you want to interact at all, I don't know if you have, you said that the Wi-Fi is unstable, so you're um, off camera, but listening. I don't know if you have enough sound to let me know, is this helpful? Um, are there other aspects of the question or the circumstance that would be helpful to explore? Hi, Jenna. Hi, Hope Alexander. You're hearing me. Uh, everything was uh, perfect. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much. You would describe the, uh, them very well. and. Uh, there is nothing else to do except to radiant love. Yes. And I can see what I can do. Sometimes it's not easy for me to to accept that uh, this is happening and uh, I don't know how to explain. Uh, in some kind, it's hurting me to see that in the world there is sh- such a how to say behavior of a young uh, young man right so. yes and it's concerning because as that matures into the world if it continues to be disruptive concerning scary uh destructive anger it it grows up into the world and then it has more power at its disposal to create destruction And so these are very important things to tune into. And I love that you can articulate that and share it and that you're there bringing love, because if we can do more of that, bring love and healing to the anger that is in the classrooms of our young children and little boys, we can really powerfully help uh, dissolve it early, give them tools um, for managing the anger and Uh, ways to express the truth of their gifts so that what is radiant in these loving and uniquely gifted ways can come forward. And what is radiant in the ways of that fire of anger can subside. You know, we've got to turn these dynamics around um, in the ways wherever we can in the moments in order to be transmuting this energy of anger and giving way for more of the radiance of, of the true light of the person to be able to come forward. And this is a great passion of mine. <laughs> and so I'm so happy, you know, to talk about this and I send my love with you, Alexandra, as you go. Um, and also, yeah, just this, all of this that we did today of be, remembering that we are surrounded by love. We are infused with love. We are love embodied and that these um, powers and forces of the cosmos are with you. <laughs> and I love that, you know, what signs these boys are and, and can, you know, frame what they're doing um, with that can, can be very useful. Um, and 
Yeah, just as I'm seeing it. So the shyer boy, and then the one who's angry and you know expressing the anger and communication, um, are they in the same classroom? Do they interact? Yes, yes, it's the same classroom, and uh, the angry boy he's attracting attracting attention, and he wants to be a superstar, and yeah. uh, his uh, body movement and everything. Uh, he attracts uh, other bigger boys in that classroom, so sure. they some kind of learn from him. But he doesn't have good uh, um, good knowledge. He has uh, a bad uh, degrees and etc. And the other uh, Aquarius boy, mm -hmm. uh, he is remarkable. He has. Uh, amazing knowledge that uh, I'm like you described. Wow! Uh, <laughs> so, but he's so shy uh, and um, something like uh, it's missing uh, self confidence to to yeah. shine and to attract others. But right. So. <laughs> Yeah. And they're going to attract others in very different ways. You know, it's that magnetic resonance, um, mm -hmm. of that attraction that, that happens. And then, um, the, the, then it can like be like a snowball, you know, that gathers more and more mass. And, and so it can lead to more disruption of the, the boys who are acting out in that way and possibly more feeling of alienation on the side of shyness. Um, so one of my thoughts would be, um, it's interesting. There's group ways of approaching things. Hello, we see your beautiful face. Um, group ways of approaching things and one-on-one -on -one ways of approaching things. Experimenting with that and seeing, you know, the Leo boy might, obviously he's comfortable expressing the anger in public. You know, he's doing that. But maybe that's kind of a protection factor where he doesn't feel comfortable expressing the vulnerability. So that might be the kind of thing, maybe bring him one-on-one -on -one or in a smaller space and see if you might be able to find any information out so that he can know that you see him because he's wanting the attention. If he can know that you see him one-on-one -on -one, and I don't know, there might be some kind of inroad in for conversation. Um, sometimes Leonids really know that they're here to be a leader. And so he might really like, you know, okay, I'm attracting this and people are, and they're looking to me and I'm going to do this. So again, you know, maybe finding a way you can channel that more creative and constructively into something that will work in the classroom and help them develop their good gifts. And, you know, I just implicitly trust that everyone has beautiful gifts to bring forward. And so he may, he may know a little bit about what that might be, or he might not. If he does, if you can find ways to help bring that out, it might really redirect some of the focus and the energy. If he doesn't, then that might be part of what his anger is about is he feels lost. He knows he's supposed to be here to help lead, but he doesn't know how to do it. So he can do it only in the ways that are getting some attention. So maybe touching on that, that kind of soul purpose of Leo is just such a big part of who they are. Helping him step into that a bit might be good. But then also if he's open at all, and some children are, and some aren't, some relationships can hold it, some can, I don't know the circumstances or the roles or what, you know, space you have, but I'd be curious if there was a way to touch on some of that hurt, some of that pain, some of that vulnerability or powerlessness, helplessness, what you might find out and then how you might be able to be an ally with him knowing that he might feel seen by you. It might be vulnerable to be seen. So then there can be some like counter anger that comes from that. So go in gently, maybe. <laughs> yeah, test it out. Uh, but sometimes with Leos, there's sometimes they're very bold and sometimes um, going in boldly or just being like, hey, this is what I see. And coming back with a little bit of that fire can actually be reassuring to them because they're like, oh, you're strong enough that you can like actually really be with me. Um, so all of that dynamic stuff is a lot to play with, but hopefully this just gives you some ideas as potential and you'll use your intuition and know what to follow up on. Yes, yes. you perfectly described everything. And, um, I tried with him to go one-on-one, -on -one, but yeah. uh, he continue in front of everyone uh -huh. to attract me, um, to attack me, <laughs> sorry, yeah. to attack me and, uh, some kind of, he want to, uh, 
prove that he is the leader in right. this group. Yeah, uh, but uh, I I did with him one on one uh, conversation. Everything was fine. Ah, okay, he interesting. You on yeah. Viber on some some in class. He just continues his uh, what he do best. Right. And, uh, being a leader on a bad way yeah 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 wow I mean it's like we just don't know someone's yeah. purpose and the past and the resonance and what may be in the future you know you might be planting a very small seed by showing being one-on-one -on -one, having a little bit more of that awareness and that may be powerful. And sometimes these things, I mean, I, I say this just to give you maybe spaciousness of like, also you have some powerlessness in the situation because he's his own being and you can't control him. You know, you have to also sort of to some degree surrender that dynamics are going to unfold. And there's a polarity that we can get into of thinking, you know, good, bad. Um, and, and to some degree, this, there is destructive behavior. There is behavior that, that amplifies and leads to harm. And there is wholesome constructive behavior, but everything that's happening is somehow highlighting resonance in the field. So there is something that he is embodying and holding space for that is of importance in this Aquarian way of the whole of humanity. And he may grow up, he may continue to fuel this anger he may become a leader that acts out in in ways you know who knows we don't know but that too has its role and will then bring forward some other forces of compassion some other forces of vulnerability that go ah i'm here to also witness this so i just have radical trust in the wholeness of life that all will be cared for and you can do what you can in your scope and uh, role in this and hopefully, you know, beautiful little moments can come forward, but just to give you that um, sense of being surrounded by something more vast and powerful than even his anger and whatever dynamics may be going mm -hmm. is that, you know, I mean, we talked about this a little yesterday. We are a world at war. Some of these boys who are angry in the classroom become leaders that are angry in the world and that generate big kinds of disruption. And as a humanity and parts of this humanity who are interested in peace, these are opportunities for us to have radical knowing that love is the greatest force. Yes. yes. No matter what. And, and I my guess, to, yeah, go ahead. I was going to interject that Emily has some wisdom to share. Oh, yes. Please. Or oh, yeah, I'm seeing more comments coming in. Yes. Uh, awesome. Yes. She says, I agree. It can feel so painful to witness the pain of young people, yes. especially since so much of it seems related to our very institutions of civilization, what we just said. I honor and witness your expression, Alexandra. All the very best to you. Thank you for offering this. Yes. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And as we're closing down, I know that Jenna has to go off and take care of horses, among other things. Oh, we're getting a snowstorm <laughs> today. It's coming down right now. Like, yes, oh. exactly. <laughs> I have that feeling. At the same time, it feels like there may be other words that need to be expressed in this group before we close. So I would open to any kind of calling of the heart to express any additional words before we leave and close the room. very uncharacteristic of me to take up time and space like this upon that kind of offer. <laughs> you just want to, to offer Alexandra in response to the beautiful, what Jenna's beautiful offering. We also, we, you also, we also don't know what distortions and pain are in his background of this angry boy and what uh, tra traumas potentially, I hope not, but unprocessed. And I only mention that because I can only imagine how frustrating it is for you in that situation sometimes. And just maybe remembering that, that there's some sort of pain in him that is potentially coming out right now. Sometimes that can help our perspective shift just enough to see something differently or something 
else. So just wanted to offer that. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. That was beautiful. Yes. Thank and that, it can be individual. It might be in his history. It might be in the family history. It can be ancestral. It can be cultural. I mean, so much trauma is woven into our lives that we have gotten used to just carrying on anyway. We overlook that these are the seeds of the pain that do express in these ways. Thank you so much, Emily. Yes. Yeah. Beautiful. And everyone, I will just um, add the maybe the most important thing because when we talk about trauma and the, all the bad things in yeah. Serbia, we had so many wars that yes. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> is it someone that doesn't have a father on, or a grandmother that wasn't in a war? Myself, I was in a war. Bombs were around me. So um, for me, it's easy to understand his pain, but it's not easy for me to, to balance his pain because I'm balancing mine. <laughs> yes. 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 And this is where having resources like this to come into space where you can be seen and loved is so important because you're on the ground level dealing with all of the emotions and the energy that it takes to just keep doing day to day with this. And so I hope you have spaces. And I'm so glad that you're here with us today where you can be held, where that, you know, this is a coherent field of care. And you need that to be able to revitalize yourself, feel your own pains, and then be able to show up in a way that can be compassionate, um, can be present, can be professional. I mean, man, that's a lot to ask and be in. And I send you just so much love as you go about this day to day and appreciate that you are there and, and reflecting so thoughtfully of these students. It is what keeps our world going around. Yes. Thank yes. you so much from the bottom of my heart. And I don't know, is it coherence or synchronicity, but a few minutes before uh, our talking outside, I was hearing the alarms for the for the war that was before, and it was first time in a, I don't know how many years. So, <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. Wow. What? Um. Just in practicality, what was the nature of hearing them today? Is everything okay? What? Uh, yeah, I think it was something accidentally, but it it it's not usually to happen accidentally to hear that sound uh, oh. around you, yeah. but. Yeah. Last few minutes before I heard it, and I yeah. was, is it happening again, or <laughs> am I missing something? But I think everything is fine <laughs> now. Oh my goodness. Well, good. I, I hope that that's the case. That it was just a false alarm, but it's it was so powerful, and like you said, such a synchronicity. So powerful to know that these alarms, that as Emily has said, it's it's a part of the past that is so deeply in pain that whatever triggers remembrance of it resurfaces you know the rawness right to the right to the surface of our lives and we don't know what kind of triggers he's having for the things he has survived at the breakfast table if there is even a breakfast table we don't know you know um, maybe you have a capacity to gather some information, but you know, what might've happened just as he's on the way out the door, what might be habitually happening every day? What are the kind of things that, um, are the coping patterns in his family that are being shown as the way to stay strong, to stay in survival? You know, he might have models that are showing that anger is a way that you do get attention and empowerment. And, um, yeah, just my heart goes out to these boys to, and to you, to Serbia, and um, to the all on the planet who know the alarm bells of war, whether it is because bombs are being dropped on a, you know, your land, or war in these other ways of conflict that emerges um, in workplaces and school places in um, even places of worship, you know, we have these uh, conflicts that arise that trigger us 
And, and so this is the nature of being human and, and why we're here is to understand that there is this resonance, there is this radiance that holds our light and coming into more and more fullness of that is the purpose of our being. And we all belong. Even the warring parts of us belong in this, in this humanity. Um, and the more, and we'll get into this when we, when we do the clarity um, teaching, but really, or, you know, transmission and, and being in the space of just exploring that topic. The, the more clear we are in this radiance, this light of our heart, the more it can dispel all of the distortions of trauma. But it's not in a way that pushes it away. It's not in a way that it excludes it. It's in that way that as we turn on a, a dimmer switch and the light gradually gets lighter in the room or as we watch the sunrise coming across the horizon, it just has that effect. It's natural, which is different than a pushing away. And so my feeling, I'm just kind of intuitively tapping into this boy, is that there might be some wrestling in his environment where people are pushing that away, pushing the anger and trauma away. And so by your presence, that just invites him to be in the classroom. That is a way of radiating love. Yes. Yes. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jenna. And thank you everyone for being here. I think you do know that we're going to be here again for the remainder of the seven days of rest at the same time, which is 11 a.m. New York time in the same Zoom room. So we invite you to join us and um, we are totally blessed by your presence. Yes, thank you so much. Thank this you. Is delightful. We appreciate you being here and coming forward with these things today. It was just magnificent. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. See you tomorrow. And yeah, uh, I also put my contact information. So we'll stay connected. If you'd like, just message me and um, we'll, who knows all the things that come next, but um, I love amassing the soul friends. So this is delightful. Thank you. Um, yeah, you want to hit recording off and I just want to ask Emily about her art. <laughs> <laughs>